Welcome to Explorer Classroom. My name is Gibbs Kuguru. I'm a shark scientist, National Geographic Explorer, and your host for today. At National Geographic, we believe that anyone can be an explorer and that you have the power to make a difference in the world no matter how old you are. Many of you are tuning in as part of the Explorer Classroom Wildlife Series and learning about wildlife globally while taking action locally. Thank you for joining us for the second event in the series. And before we get into today's lesson, I'd like to welcome all of the following classes who are joining us today, especially Corvallis School District 1, Wirtland Middle School, La Paz Middle School, Salinas Union High District, Headway School, and Milton Elementary School. We are so glad to have all of you here. Today, our explorer is Christine Lin. Christine is a documentary filmmaker whose work showcases the incredible world of birds and reveals the hidden life of mysterious animals in tide pools. She also works with indigenous communities to help capture their efforts to protect our planet. Christine's work has recently taken her from the coastline of San Diego, California, to the Everglades, a wetland area in Florida, and finally to a small community in Canada called Litzelke. In a moment, Christine will be joining us live to share inspiring stories about how marine conservation, birds, and indigenous storytelling, and of course, to answer your questions. But first, she's going to take us to the tide pools in San Diego to tell us more about her current project. Let's join with Christine in the field. Hi there, my name is Christine Lin. I'm a National Geographic Explorer and I'm a documentary filmmaker. So right now I'm at the Ocean Beach Tide Pools in San Diego and I'm filming some tide pool creatures for an upcoming TV show for National Geographic. So here you can see a creature called a sea anemone on the right with its tentacles all spread out. In the next clip, you'll see the same type of animal, the sea anemone, but outside of the water. So it's using seashells to protect itself from the elements. And now we see a shore crab underwater and all these little critters floating around it are food for the crab. Okay, folks, we are excited that we have Christine here live to share more about her work and get a closer look at the camera she uses to capture these incredible images in the tide pools. Christine, welcome to Explore a Classroom. Thanks, Gibbs, and welcome, everyone. It's so good to see all of your faces here today. My name is Christine Lin. I'm a National Geographic Explorer, and I'd love to talk about some tide pools with you all. So in those clips that you just saw, the camera that I used was this camera. And as you can see, it looks like it's missing something, and that's because this is just the body of the camera. So what you can do is you can attach different types of lenses this is one type of lens. Um, the one you saw in the clip in the beginning is a probe lens. So it lets you get really up close to the critters. And you can also attach things to the top of this camera, like a light, or you can attach a camera, I mean, a, a microphone, um, just to like build out your kit to get exactly what you need to capture those critters. And so another lens I want to show you that's pretty cool because I've been playing around with this. If you don't have a camera, you can also use something like this. This. So this is a macro lens, which means it lets you get really up close to whatever you want to capture as well. And it's for your phone. So if you have a phone that takes pictures, you can clip it directly onto your phone like this. And then you can get really up close and take some cool pictures of tide pool creatures or of whatever wildlife is in your backyard. And the reason I love tide pools is because I love how they go through this process of change every single day as the tides rise and fall. And as a result, these creatures like the anemones, some barnacles, some crabs, they have to go through, um, they have to adapt and they have to come up with a lot of different ways to survive their environment. So anyone who has access to the coastline um, probably has access to tide pools. But even if you don't, like me, when I was growing up in Dallas, Texas, I was really far away from the ocean, but I had access to trees around me and bugs and fossils. So no matter where you are, you can check out your environment in your own way. And so now I wanna share some short video clips that I took with that camera that you saw. So now we'll look at, this is the sea anemone again. And as you can see, it's underwater. So its tentacles are just spreading out, opening up 
And what it does with its tentacles is it uses it to feed. Um, and it's actually an animal, so it's moving. And it also uses its tentacles to sting its opponents. So an opponent could be uh, an anemone from another clan, or it can be just another predator. So in the next clip, I'm going to show you this is a gooseneck barnacle, and this is outside of the water, so it's all closed up, but it's actually a crustacean. So when it's underwater, gooseneck barnacles also come alive, and their legs, they use their legs to filter feed um, and do all sorts of things. And you can see in the middle of these gooseneck barnacles are some shells. Those are uh, mussels. So you'll see they all work together to balance out the ecosystem. And the last clip I want to show you here is a shore crab. So you can see this is underwater as well. And I think it's really cute because it's using its pinchers to pinch off all these little bits of algae to feed. So as you can see, each of these animals has a different way of adapting to its environment. So that's what's really cool about tide pools. And we'll learn some more about birds in a second. So, okay, friends. Thanks for letting me share all these things about tide pools. And now I think Gibbs has a quick game. So take it away. Thanks, Christine. Okay. We just heard about the wonderful biodiversity that exists in tide pools. Biodiversity is the variety of life that you may find in a specific area. And there's biodiversity all around us. So let's play a quick game and have a little bit of fun. You're going to see a few close-up pictures that Christine has taken of different tide pools and the life within them. After looking at each picture, let us know what you think it is. Select a name from a multiple choice option that best represents what's in the picture. Students, share your answers aloud with your teacher. And teachers, type the letter or the name that you hear in the chat bar. So let's go with this first picture. Right on. What do you guys think this is? It looks kind of hard on the outside, maybe soft on the inside. Uh, let's see some of these answers coming in. I see a lot of people are saying C, 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 C. Uh, we got one B there, two Bs, and a whole mountain load of Cs. Another B, one A. Someone has written out barnacles. Oh man, all right. Well, the correct answer is indeed C, a gooseneck barnacle. Well done, guys. Ah, that one actually stumped me. All right, on to the next one. What do you guys think this one is? It's got some long, long bits coming out of it a little bit. Oh, I'm seeing a lot of people comment A. It's a flood of A's. Ooh-wee. Oh, man, we're not going to fool you guys today, are we, huh? <laughs> Indeed, the right answer is A. You guys got it right. A plus is for, for everyone. All right, and let's move on to the last one. Mm-hmm. What could this one be? It's kind of got uh, these little spiny bits coming out. Maybe it's got a bit of a, a tougher, tougher skin, tougher shell, tougher exterior. I'm seeing a lot of A's, tons of A's. Is it going to be A plus again? I see a B there. Some B's and A's, lots of A's, lots of A's. I see one C. All right. Uh-oh, someone is changing their mind. Folks Ranch is changing their mind, and they're going to go with... Uh... Oh, there's a lot of A's. All right. I am going to give you guys an answer, and the answer now is B, is B. Ah, that stumped me completely. I would have not got that one. I thought it was C for sure. All right. Great work playing this game, uh, friends. Uh, it looks like you guys really know your wildlife. Now, let's continue on our journey as Christine offers us a lens into the incredible world of birds with a short trailer for her documentary about the wood stork in the Florida Everglades. Thank you. 
Wow, Christine, that was inspiring. I can't believe you made that. Um, and I can't also wait to learn more about the wood stork, uh, why they're an endangered species, and what we can do to help protect them. Um, so, well, back to you, my friend. Thanks so much, Gibbs. Yeah, the wood stork is such a cool prehistoric looking bird, right? So I had the chance to go to the Florida Everglades early last year when um, I went to Audubon's Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary to talk about this story about wood storks and the people that are there on the ground every day to protect them. So wood storks are really endangered species. They used to come to the Florida Everglades to nest in the thousands and even hundreds of thousands. But over the past years, over the past few decades, they've been their numbers have really been going down. And a part of that is actually because of climate change and water level rise. But there's people on the ground there doing the work that they're doing to protect these birds and bring them back. So when I went to the Florida Everglades last year for Flight of the Wood Stork, a central question I was asking was, what can we do to protect wildlife like the wood stork species? And so I interviewed all these people and they really inspired me because I saw these leaders on the ground doing what they what they knew to protect the birds, such as um, people who were experts in water or people who were experts in drone photography. And they were using all their skills to come together and work on this one goal together. And so like tide pool creatures, birds are also a part of our ecosystems. And what they're really cool for is they're indicators of climate change. Because if you notice, if you look around you, birds are all around us. So they use all these different habitats. And so if bird numbers are dwindling, then that's an indicator that we need to do more to protect their habitats. So now I'm going to share with you another clip from my documentary that tells you a little bit more about why wood storks are a key part of this environment and how they're intimately connected with the most unlikely of animals, which is alligators. The wood storks really prefer to nest on islands, and so they really like to be on tall trees that are surrounded by water. And even better than that, they like to be on tall trees surrounded by water with alligators in that water. The alligators are providing protection of their nests and keeping mammalian predators from coming across that water, climbing the trees, and getting to their eggs and their nestlings. At the same time, the alligators are choosing to be in the trees underneath the wood storks because they're benefiting from anything that falls from that nest. The bird's eye view that you get of the sanctuary is not the same as it used to be. You don't see those islands of trees with standing water underneath because we have so much other vegetation growing up around it. I love that fact about how wood storks and alligators are unlikely allies in balancing out this ecosystem. And so one thing I wanted to talk about for filming this was the power of observation. And what I love about birds is that when you're going out to observe them, you really tune in to the present moment because you're not only looking, you're also listening to the bird calls and any you're looking for any behaviors that come up. And so one tool I like to use is this, which is a pair of binoculars. And it's come in handy so many times while I've been out filmmaking um, because oftentimes before I even bring my camera, I'll use my binoculars to look for the birds because oftentimes they're really far away and to notice some behaviors that are taking place and really taking the moment to just absorb the environment around me. And these binoculars are pretty cool. You have these eyepieces where um, if you're wearing glasses, you'd push them down like this. But if you're not wearing glasses, you'd push up the eyepieces to get a better look at them. And then you can use this knob to focus just like you use a lens on a camera to focus on the bird. And also another tip while I'm filmmaking is, especially for something like this, for Flight of the Wood Stork, where I was working with a lot of experts and scientists, but I was the only person filming. I had two cameras on me. So one, I used a camera with a lens like this to film people. And another camera that I had was specifically for the birds. So this lens is wider, which means it's good for people, but for birds, you wanna get really up close to them, just like with tide pool creatures. But oftentimes birds are pretty far away. So having a big zoom lens, um, which means you can really zoom in on the bird really helps. And it helps me be prepared whenever a bird comes up. 
So now that you've seen footage from my documentary and heard about some wood storks, let's go back to our host. Wow, what an incredible look into the importance of birds and why they matter. So in order to share this beautiful footage with you, Christine had to spend a lot of time observing birds in their natural habitat. And many of you have already been practicing observing wildlife in your local communities as part of the Spot the Wildlife mission. I bet many of you spotted birds. Uh, they're the type of animal you can see in locations almost anywhere in the world. Now, I'd love to put you in Christine's shoes to continue to practice being an explorer that observes nature. So we're going to show you a juvenile woodstock, uh, sorry, a wood stork from Christine's, Christine's documentary and pay close attention to its behaviors and actions. You know, something that you might notice is that the, the wood stork is sort of rooting around, uh, kind of looking for something, and it keeps pecking its, its, its beaks into the water and also using its feet to sort of feel around for what things are going on around it. But what could it be doing? Students. Now that we've seen the juvenile wood stork, share what you think this behavior means. Teachers, type your students' responses into the chat bar. The question is, what do you think this behavior means? I'm excited to see some of these answers. WMS Wildcat says, hunting for prey. Dickinson seventh grade says, looking for fish. Any more answers? Keep them coming, guys. Eating, searching for food. Andres R says, I think they're looking for fish. Plenty of answers that say looking for food, hunting for fish. Uh, Narek says, hunting for prey, looking for food. There's a lot of answers that say looking for food. Ooh, here's an interesting one, gathering nest materials. Interesting, interesting. So it doesn't draw attention to itself from Togger Man. All right. The correct answer is foraging for food. Uh, I think you guys really understand your wildlife uh, because that answer was pretty much simple for you guys. Uh, we'll try to make it a little, little bit more difficult next time. I think it's really fun to step into Christine's shoes. And speaking of shoes, Explorer Classroom has taught us that explorers don't walk alone, and collaboration is key for success. So let's go back to Christine to learn how she's currently working with Indigenous communities to protect our planet. Back to you, Christine. Thanks, Gibbs. Yeah, so a recent project that I worked on is actually the first project that was funded uh, by National Geographic. And this is a short film that I made called Watchers of the Land. And what was really cool was I got to work with um, an indigenous community called the Lutzelke First Nations. And we went to the border of the Arctic Circle, um, all the way in the northern part of Canada. And what we wanted to focus on is how are how do we reconnect with our homeland and how do we work with each other to protect wildlife in our local communities. So I want to show you this picture of one of the guardians. This person is Ruben and he's part of the Nihatni Dene Guardians program. Nihatni Dene translates to watchers of the land. And so what's really cool is there's this group of guardians on the ground protecting their land that they're opening up as a national park called Thai Denanene, which translates to land of the ancestors. And if you look at what he's holding, he also has a pair of binoculars, just like I do. And these people use binoculars for a lot of different reasons. Part of it is to look for birds, other wildlife, and also to look for other people who might need help when they're out on the land. And so I'll show you a poster of this film here. It is um, Watches of the Land. And you can see someone in blue uh, 
on top of this really big cliff. And this is part of their Thaidinanene indigenous protected area. And so that person in blue over there is Iris Catholic. She's super cool. She is the manager of the park right now. And I was so inspired spending those two weeks with her out in the land and seeing how she connects to her land. So none of this is possible without a whole team. And I'll show you a behind the scenes picture. There's me on the right. There's uh, Sophia, the producer. There's Jeremy, the cinematographer. Vicky, the sound recordist. And we also had a fifth member. That's Nala, the dog. And she's actually Iris's dog who joined us on the boats and while we were camping. So she was a pretty good fifth addition, I would say. Um, now I'm going to show you a picture of the landscape of Lutzel Cay. Um, and as you can see, it's a pretty small town. There's about 300 people, but they're protecting this huge swath of land. And it's really cool if you notice it's kind of bright, but, but I actually took this picture really late in the night because we were so far up north during the summer, it doesn't fully get dark. So we got to look at these beautiful sunsets throughout the night every single day. So lastly, I'm going to show you a group picture of the Nihatni Dene Guardians. <laughs> they, they look really happy because they had just put up this new welcome sign. It says, welcome to Thai Dene land of the ancestors. And so with this, I just want to emphasize the importance of working with local community members. And I want to bring it to you all. Who are the local wildlife heroes in your life? Because we all need them. And wherever we are, we need to work together in order to protect the wildlife that we love. So thanks again for letting me talk about my film, Watchers of the Land, and why communities are so important for wildlife conservation. Back to you, Gibbs. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that, Christine. It's really amazing, all the work that you do. And there's so much we can learn from our local communities and the people that live closest to wildlife for generations. So I want to turn it around to you guys. Are there people or organizations in your community that are helping to protect wildlife? In a moment, let's share our ideas in the chat bar. But first, I'd like to give an example from my work. Uh, in the Maldives, uh, where I work with sharks, they used to catch and kill these sharks to sell them. Uh, but they found out that if they bring people from all around the world to dive with these animals, they can actually save them and earn a few extra dollars. So by diving with sharks, they actually found a way to conserve them. And they found out that these animals are worth more alive than dead. Okay, students, now it's your turn. Who are the people or organizations that work in your areas to protect local wildlife? Students, share your answers aloud with your teachers. And teachers, type some of the answers that you hear in the chat bar. The question here again is, who are the people or organizations that work to protect local wildlife in your communities? I'd love to see some of these answers. All right, I'm seeing vets from Miss Strauss's third graders. That's a good one. Um, Belle Isle Marsh. Um, animal clinics, that's a really good one. Uh, that comes from Dickinson, seventh grade. Um, Folks Ranch, fifth grade explorer says something quite interesting, and I love this one. It says, we're helping protect our environment by picking up trash and debris in our community. That is 100% the way to participate in protecting wildlife. I, I love that, guys. Keep up the good work. Um, WMS Wildcats has some really nice examples here. They said game wardens, park rangers, Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. That's a good one. Um, National Park Rangers also from 105 Grizzlies. Mrs. Lee's fifth graders explorers, fifth grade explorers says students. Indeed, students can very much be wildlife warriors and protectors. Um, let's see a few more. Uh, all right, and we have another one, Placerita Nature Center, and that comes from Wildlife Grizzlies as well. These are really great answers, guys. Absolutely love seeing the work that's being done in your local communities. Uh, and uh, thank you, Christine, for bringing us into the field with you and sharing the importance of stories to protect wildlife. We've had so much fun learning about the tide pools, birds, and also how to collaborate with indigenous communities. Yeah, and thank you all for continuing to share your answers and experiences. I'm so inspired by all of you in the classrooms today. 
Right on. Now, for the moment you've all been waiting for, we're going to kick off the Q&A portion of the show. If you're watching online, send us your questions in the chat bar. We record all of them as they're sent in, so please only send each answer one time. Teachers, please also let us know who's asking the question so we can give your class or student a shout out. If you're an on-screen guest, get ready with a nice loud voice and I'll tell you when it's your turn. Right on. Uh, we have a, another two-part question from YouTube. Uh, Christine, what is your favorite tide pool animal? And the second question is, what's your favorite bird? I love these questions. So my favorite animals, I think, are always changing. But today, my favorite tide pool animal, it's got to be the sea anemone, which I showed you before, because I just think they're so fascinating. I used to think they were plants, and then I learned that they're actually animals. And the fact that they have so many interactions with each other that, you know, Anemones, they clone themselves and it's called the fissioning process. And then they engage in full on battles. Like, I just think that's so cool. It's a whole other world. And my favorite bird at the moment, I really like seabirds. So right now my favorite bird is the razorbill. So that's a bird you can find in Maine and other parts of the coast. And what's really cool about them is that when they're little, when they first grow up when they're about to fledge out of their nest, they walk to the edge of the cliff where their nests are and they make a huge leap of faith. They just jump out into the open ocean beyond. So I think that's very brave and <laughs> I'm inspired by by these little uh, razor bills bravery. And I'd also like to turn around to you all and I'm curious if you have a favorite underwater creature or a favorite bird, uh, feel free to drop them in the chat. All right, guys, drop some of your favorite birds in the chat and I'll read some of the answers out in a minute. Right on. Uh, here's another question from Queen Ervin and the Royal Scientist. Uh, how do you film underwater while scuba diving? That's a good question as well. And that's something that I'm learning. So it's another thing like you can never stop learning. And this underwater filmmaking is something that I'm very excited to do more of, especially now that I do live near the ocean. Um, so one thing I would say and what tips I've heard from a lot of people is to really be comfortable in the water first. So what I've started doing a lot is just going out in the water as much as I can snorkeling or even just scuba diving without a camera and just being comfortable with observing the creatures around you. And then once you're comfortable enough, then when you bring the camera, it's just that much easier. And um, yeah, one thing I'd say having a little underwater GoPro is really helpful, um, but you can also build out your kit eventually and bring lights in um, and bring in all sorts of cool, cool equipment. I don't know if you have anything to add, Gibbs, as a shark scientist. Well, no, you hit the nail right on the head. And, and this goes for me as well. In order to be a good underwater cameraman, you have to be comfortable in the water in any situation. Uh, and then you have to be a good cameraman. So it's really a two-part uh, two story there. All right, I'd love to read some of these uh, favorite birds here. And I got to say, guys, already you guys know way more birds than I do now. Uh, <laughs> I'm seeing, yeah, bluebird, uh, people, uh, Togerman says eagles. Um, I see one called firefly squid from amber. I don't know what that bird is, um, but it sounds amazing. Uh, ravens, uh, cardinal and blue jay. Ooh, um, Christine, you might have to tell me which one this is. This is there's a bird called an axolotl. Do you know what that is? Oh, axolotl. I think that um, axolotl. That's a, yeah, the axolotl. Yeah, that's an underwater creature. That's an amphibian. Oh, it's not even a bird. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I asked two parts. So either underwater or bird oh. or birds that go underwater. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> nice. Um, okay, the black dragonfish. Lovely. I didn't even know that one existed. Um, Folks Ranch fifth grade explorer says, we love great white sharks. That's a win. That's a win. Well, jellyfish, sea star, shrimp, and then the box jellyfish. Ooh. Um, Sarah says chicken. Uh, uh, what's a, Tell us a cool fact about a chicken. Is there, is there some cool bird facts about chickens we should know? I Me? Yeah, do you know any? 
actually I met a I met a pretty smart chicken when I went to um, an Audubon sanctuary a few years ago and this chicken so this was a rehabilitated chicken that was rescued and the the people there had actually trained the chicken to rec there were like two pictures and they trained the chicken to always peck at one picture when she asked mm. the chicken a question so that's pretty cool I think I think like you can chickens are trainable they're pretty smart I didn't know chickens were that smart that's amazing you learn something new every day thanks thanks you guys for dropping these uh uh these animals in here I'm going to pick one more that I don't know and then I'm going to see okay does anyone here know what a goldfinch is that comes from Miss Snyder's ELP goldfinch have you heard of that one that's a great bird. Yeah, there's the American goldfinch, which has um, a lot of yellow and black on it. And it's such a beautiful bird. And um, yeah, I had the opportunity to, to see it a few times. It's, it's a pretty good backyard bird, too. It'll come to your feeders quite often. Amazing. Guys, you've really inspired me. I need to learn more about birds now. I've been too invested in the sharks. I'd like <laughs> to get another question now from YouTube. Um, from Nicole Dickinson, Lily asked, what is your favorite thing about your job? Oh, that's also a good question. So I have a lot of cool parts of my job that I really enjoy. I got to say my favorite part is when I can both be out in the field and nature and also interacting with the people who are protecting wildlife because for me i love being outside um, but what i'm really inspired by is other people as well and people who are on the ground and it's so cool to to learn from everyone because everyone has such different fields of expertise um just like you gives with the sharks and like i love tide pools and and birds and it's, it's really cool to share that experience with other people nice yeah, I think that's a perfect marriage of, of wildlife and people, you know, coexistence at its finest. Um, another one from YouTube. Uh, Ella would like to know, have you seen any really rare animals and do you have any photos of them to share? Ooh, I have seen, so besides the wood stork, which is pretty endangered, another cool bird that I saw was uh, a few years ago, I went back down to Texas and I went to the coast of Texas and I made a short film about the whooping crane. So that's also an endangered species. And it was cool to participate in the whooping crane festival. And it was a whole festival to invite people to appreciate them and also to protect them. And so what we did was we went out on a boat two times in a row, like one, one morning. And then we went again the next morning and it was like a six hour boat ride, um, through the wetlands to, to find these whooping cranes. So that was really cool. And that you can watch on Audubon as well. Ooh, cool. Do you know why it's called a whooping crane? That's a good question. So they, their call sounds literally like a whoop. Um, mm. <laughs> it's kind of like a, kind of like a peacock. If, if you've ever heard of a peacock, um, yeah, they have a really interesting bird call. I'm going to see if I can search that on YouTube after this is done. Mm -hmm. Whooping crane. I'm going to try and remember that one. All righty. Um, ooh, Mrs. K Kurt Kirst. Tell I can't say that name. <laughs> Third wave class would like to know how many films have you created? Oh, that's a good question. I should count. I think right now I'm I'm looking. I have. Flight of the Wood Stork, I have Feathers Gone Viral, Whooping Cranes. When I was in college, I made two short films, Falconers of Havana, uh, when I was studying abroad in Cuba. Um, and I made another one called Envuelto en Plazo, so just wrapped in applause. Then I made another one in Spain. Um, so I'd say like six, seven. Oh, it Watches of the Land, of course. So at least seven. <laughs> oh, but wow. there's more to come. Okay, well, the next documentary I hope you're going to make is with me. Please invite me. I would love that. Yeah, sign me up. All right. Um, and I would like to ask one more question. Uh, and that comes from Dickinson's seventh grade. And that is, have you ever seen a Henslow Sparrow? Ooh, I might have, but I'm looking it up right now to see if I remember. Oh, I think I have seen a Henslow Sparrow. Yeah. So if you look at a picture of one, they're this really cute 
sparrow that has some brown and yellow bits on it. Yes, I think I have seen one. Mm. Yeah, it's a good prairie bird. Yeah, there's so many cool birds. And and these are such fantastic questions, my friends. Um, but actually, I just have one more question, actually, that I would really like to ask Christine. Uh, and that is, um, actually, Christine, maybe you actually have a question for us. Yes, I do. So my question for all of you watching is, I'm curious, what are the local wildlife stories that you'd all like to capture? And there's so many ways to tell these stories. You don't have to just use a camera. Um, but if you do, you can do films, you can take photos, or you can draw or you can do whatever, um, you know, speaks to your heart. So my question is, how would you like to tell these stories? And what would you like to capture? All right. So did you guys get that question from Christine? And ooh, as the question is, uh, what kinds of stories would you like to tell with the wildlife? Yeah, so I really love seabirds. I'd love to talk about seabirds more because I, I had a chance to make a short video series called Seabird Secrets last year. Um, I love to get more into underwater storytelling as well. And I'm just really fascinated by animals that interact with kelp force specifically, because I, I one of the coolest uh, recent dive experiences I had was last year, I visited um, Catalina Island, which is in um, California, and I got to see the really big, tall kelp forest. So that's another, that's another story I'd love to tell. Lovely. Um, and I'd just like to read a few answers from some of the students about the stories they want to tell with wildlife. Um, Amber says she would like to capture a red panda. Oh, those are gorgeous, cute creatures. Uh, WMS Wildcats uh, says they like to tell stories about coyote populations that have been in the rise and look at the source of what's causing their populations to increase. Nice. I like these. Uh, these are really well thought out documentaries. Um, how many sturgeon are in our Lake Lake, lake Champlain? Uh, that comes from Miss Strauss' third graders. Um, okay, one more here. Uh, the white belly woodpecker, and that comes from Narek. Interesting. White belly woodpecker. I've, every time I look at this chat, I see a new bird, a new bird or a new tide pool creature that I never knew about. All right, thanks for these answers, guys, and thanks for your participation. We just actually have one more question, and that final question is for Christine. What message do you want to give to the next generation of explorers out there? Yeah, I love that question. And I'm so lucky to have been able to travel to a lot of places to capture these wildlife and, and talk about why it's important to protect them. But I also want to emphasize that you don't have to go to the most extreme or wild places to be an explorer and a storyteller. Because sometimes the coolest way to connect with nature and communicate that with other people is by exploring your own backyard. And in that way, you become an explorer wherever you are. All right, thank you again to Christine and all the students and teachers for watching. Now, we have a mission for all you students participating as part of the wildlife series. This week, your mission is to map your local wildlife. As you practice what it takes to be an explorer, we want you to visualize and map where wildlife may be active around your community. And you might be surprised by what you find. Teachers, please use the educator guide to learn more about the mission. Thank you again for joining this second episode of the Explorer Classroom Wildlife Series. Next week, we will welcome Explorer Roxanne Beltran, a marine biologist to the show, and she will give us a glimpse into the underwater world of elephant seals and share specialized maps she creates to better understand how they move around the open ocean. Have a great day, everyone. Stay curious, keep exploring, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. See you later.